हेलो एवरी वन आई एम स्वीकृति होस्ट ऑफ कोर यूजर टू यू एक्स पॉडकास्ट इंडियाज फर्स्ट पॉडकास्ट ऑन यूजर एंड यू एक्स रिसर्च आर गेस्ट फॉर टूडेज एपिसोड इज जोल बाय जोल इज द लीड यूजर रिसर्चर एट सी डी के ग्लोबल एंड एन एक्सपर्ट इन सेटिंग अप रिसर्च कल्चर एंड प्रोसेस इन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन जोल इज ऑल्सो वन ऑफ द मोस्ट काइंड एंड कम्पैशनेट पर्सनैलिटीज आई एवर मेट ही इम्प्लीमेंट्स ऑल हिज लाइफ लर्निंग्स टू हिज पैशन फॉर यूजर रिसर्च and helps others along the way so let's dive right in hi joel uh, it is an honor to have you in the show your experience in ux research is phenomenal and inspiring at the same time and even your stories that we have talked about previously and i intend to cover everything in our episode today but you're going to make me boss <laughs> okay but that's true <laughs> Uh, so first i like to start up about your ux researcher journey and so to give a little bit of background to everyone you have worked in diverse sectors you have worked in a sector like health and now you're working for a sector which automates the car dealership and sales processes and data analysis poles apart so how do you adjust or adapt quickly where the target audience is so different and even the personas are so different how do you adapt as a ux researcher so fast that's a really good question <laughs> that's a really good question and that's not the only thing i've done either i've done retail i've done hardware i've done supply chain i've done internal um i've tried to make it in my career to where i can where i've touched as many different pies as i or got my thumbs into as many pies as i could right absolutely uh, cuz i i wanted to be the kind of, i wanted to be the kind of researcher where i could walk into any job and be able to speak with authority on just about any uh subject matter or any uh customer facing or business facing application i could hmm. there is one underlying thing kind of like a magic formula that allows any user researcher to walk into just about any business and uh proceed to practice in a, in a manner that is consistent across everything and that's process. Hmm. And I've often said that what really separates early in career user researchers from senior uh user researchers is process and point of view or process and ethos if you're familiar and and i'm happy to go through it with you if you want for the early and career folks on the in the audience so ethos for me is um the emotional reason why i get up and do what i do every day is because if i put the user at the center of every design uh that i do research on ultimately i'm going to impact the entire world through better and more ease more intuitive and more delightful design mm. right because ux research influences ux design always 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 we talk to product but ultimately what we trade in is evidence that gets put into a design mm-hmm. process begins with meetings right mm-hmm. so meetings then uh we figure out what uh who we want to test mm-hmm. and why we want to test them right then we go into the repository your mm-hmm. your library and make sure that this work has never been done before because mm. no one likes to do and spend money on research mm. only to find out that it's been done five or six times over mm-hmm. reinventing the wheel is not good practice in business uh from there you'd write up a research proposal and then when once everybody's signed off on the uh research proposal uh you schedule your users you go do the research work and then from there so that's the hard part the easy part is is almost prescriptive right mm. so you do work you debrief mm. analyze you report and then you put it in the archive mm. bing 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 down the way mm. um and i'm telling you if you follow that same process mm. it doesn't matter how mature a ux research program is when you walk in the door So mm-hmm. like my speciality is building uh processes out at in companies. So I've built entire user research uh programs out for giant enterprises that were none existed before. Mm-hmm. 
And if you if you develop that process as a user researcher, it doesn't matter where you could walk in. You walk into the local rug shop, you can go down the street to the grocery, you can go uh, to the healthcare folks. It's all going to be the same process. It's, it, the only thing that changes is the users and the, and the, and the, product, uh, the product and the UX designers. That's it. So now that you've elaborated, it is answering, answering my previous question better in the sense that your process is so core and central that it mm -hmm. fits everywhere. Mm -hmm. Be it a rug shop or something like CDK that you're working in right now, a large corporation. So yeah, that's- It's basically this, now Now there are changes, right? So there are, there are variables in this, right? And it's not all, all size fits one. It's basically all about size fits one. One is budgeting, right? If you don't have a fully budgeted uh, program mm -hmm. uh, where you can afford tools and things like that, it makes it a lot harder. If you mm -hmm. don't have, um, honorarium budgets right so we have a, a certain amount of budget that we can pay users to talk to if you don't have one of those it makes it a little tougher it's not impossible you can do them on shoestrings it just makes them tough yep um the other one is buy-in from uh product c-suite uh managers higher like upper level folks if they don't believe in the value of ux you're going to fight an uphill battle you're going to be like sisyphus pu pushing a boulder up the hill it's you're going to get yeah. Up and it'll roll back down all over you. Absolutely. Research process is still a very popular term. But as I've started my career in UX research, the more challenging thing I've found to be is analysis. Like there is so much data and like different users unearthing different insights and ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm actually very interested in your analysis process. How do you start? How how did you arrive upon it? So if you could shed some light on that, it would be great. Couple things. One, um, how do I put this? Ideally, and in an ideal sense, mm -hmm. you have enough users to formulate a you have enough users to formulate uh, some kind of analysis or some kind of conclusion, mm -hmm. right? So we're not talking one user, we're not talking two years, we're not talking three. We're talking like eight to 10 or more, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Also in an ideal state, hopefully you've got really good observers who are taking lots of notes so that you can talk freely with a participant without worrying about time or without worrying about uh, taking notes yourself, mm -hmm. right? Ideal state. Do sometimes I it happens, sometimes it doesn't. So then most times when it doesn't, it means that you're going to spend all your time taking notes and you're going to have to use those as in your analysis. Mm -hmm. If you have the observers and if you've talked to enough people, then when you go and do your debrief, right, you'll have, uh, you'll have all the, your, your observers notes kind of in one place and then you can stack like with like, mm -hmm. right? And you take the first, the top, I don't know, three or four, roughly of those stacks of notes that everybody heard across all the users. Mm -hmm. All your so all of your observers have taken their notes and we're going to um, we're going to stack that which everybody heard at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right. And then based on those, your analysis job is halfway done. Mm -hmm. Then all you have to do is apply what all the observers heard to what is applicable in the design mm. and there's your analysis mm -hmm. After and what that what that means to you is is up to you mm. so after hearing this i realized that the analysis process is very can be very customized from company to, to company along with the research process obviously uh, mm -hmm. but the research process as a term and idea is quite popularized, but this analysis process is not that much. So maybe that is the reason that uh, we haven't been able to arrive on a core uh, process uh, which sort of can fit everywhere, but there are nuances in every company, that's the thing. There's a guy, a really nice guy who's a user researcher. He's ex-Uber, his name is... 
Dr. George Zhang, Z-H-A-N-G. Mm-hmm. Incredibly smart man, incredibly nice and humble man, and uh, just a ball to talk to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he came up with a, a debriefing method that makes analysis a cinch called stop, start, continue. Mm-hmm. And it was him and another researcher at Uber, I want to say, and this was many moons ago, but he he was nice enough to publish it uh, online and and I pretty much uh, immediately adopted it because it came from George and George is really smart. So I'll buy what he has to sell. Mm. Uh, So that's what I use almost, uh, almost exclusively. And so when I do generative work, another really good designer named Margot Yoon, Mm. that's Y O O N. She came up with a variation on it that was uh, actionable, non-actionable and consider rather than start, stop, continue. Hmm. so Margot's version is for generative work George is more for usability hmm. thank you so much for sharing that mm-hmm. that's really useful information so um, now I want to move to a little more personal aspect of your story in general uh, okay. and how it is related to UX and how is it enabling you to become a better UX researcher day by day? Okay. So you shared with me in our, you know, intro call that you um, experienced homelessness or you were a homeless man in the streets of New York. And I have a hypothesis on that, that if someone has experienced something like that, then for that person, the value of life changes drastically. Yeah. You will go to find a job it won't just be about survival, but also something that fulfills your soul. Yep. That's my hypothesis. If I'm wrong, please uh, feel free to correct nope. me. You're dead on right. You're dead on correct. So yeah, if that hypothesis is true, um, what was so fulfilling about UX research and what attracted you to that, that not only giving you money, but at the same time, pushing you to the path of greatness in the role that you have chosen. The one thing that being homeless will teach you is how to be resilient. Hmm. And it, it, it's, it's, it, I would say it's, it's an experience that, I, that you never want to wish on anybody, but it's an experience that everybody should have at least once in their life. To lose everything that you own in the world, everything that is precious, including your own ego, Mm -hmm. and having to go to perfect strangers and ask for help to -hmm. survive. I think that it when if and when you have that opportunity, what comes of it is a is an empathy that isn't found, I think, anywhere else. Now I could be wrong, but for me, for my for for what I experienced, there isn't a single user I've ever met who I can't empathize with somehow. Mm. And I've I've talked to people who have had some of the worst circumstances one can ever imagine, um, and that empathy with users, especially as it relates to how digital technology affects their lives in in communicating and and and, uh, enabling them to to perform whatever task there is to do in their life in order to bring them hope or delight um, is is quintessentially what why I do what I do Um, how I got into user research which is I think part of what what are your questions I had a professor who was a very good is a very good man Mm. and his he was the head of the department of psychology at old dominion university in norfolk virginia Mm. and uh he's he he was also a trumpet player and he was a very nice gentleman his name was uh james bliss Mm -hmm. i was used to ribbon him i always used to make fun of him i'd say dr bliss dr bliss you you missed your boat sir i go you should have gone into self-help and wrote self-help books who in the hell doesn't want to get happy with dr bliss Mm. Well, so when I graduated, he said, 
he goes, what do you want to do now? And I said, well, I'd love to go work in, uh, in military applications, doing research and design on plane cockpits, mm. on fighter plane cockpits, because mm. a good number of my family are, fi- are fighter pilots. Mm. And, and he said, well, you, you need a PhD to do that. Do you have a PhD? I said, no, I don't. I just got my bachelor's degree. He goes, why don't you look at something called UX? Mm-hmm. rest of history now i'd been homeless mm-hmm. up until that point i'd gone to film school i had uh crashed around people's couches i'd been a bartender bouncer uh i was a fishmonger for a while i'd held just about just just about every job one could want to hold to kind of gain life experience mm-hmm. i'd never found one that i loved doing so much that i would get up in the morning at three in the morning like you are and do it mm-hmm. all the way till dawn yeah Mm-hmm. Um, and that was what UX was for me is when I woke up and I hadn't gotten, I was working in my very first startup, mm-hmm. my very first uh, digital startup. And I was building, um, a, a, a digital research program and, and I hadn't, I didn't get paid for it. I never did get paid for it. Uh, I never I worked for a full year, just building a research process. Mm-hmm ever got paid for it and every single day I got up excited to go to work mm-hmm. even though I wasn't getting paid doing it mm-hmm. which is where I get my my thing never ever work for free right don't ever work for free because I've worked for free mm-hmm. in U.S. and it sucks yeah. but there's nothing there's nothing more satisfying to me than getting up in the morning and going and doing these research mm-hmm. I can't imagine doing anything else mm-hmm. that is so delightful to hear and uh, the thing about empathy that you mentioned mm. it is really important not just because you know it is an inherent quality that we as user experience researchers should have but also uh, we are dealing with human stories here and mm. at the same time we also want to profit a certain organization or help them make profit so you have to find a balance where you are not sounding too greedy as a researcher from the organization side and at the yeah. same time understanding the stories of your users apart from the role that you are targeting at so you are you have a car dealership company so you are just just targeting at car buyers but there are a lot more things apart from that mm-hmm. so in that balance is right uh, like is important i uh, think that's right mm. yeah i so, think that's right so so that you have uh, you know talk to people who have gone through unimaginable crap um how have you been able to find that balance because i am struggling with that right now i mm. talk to users who have different socio economic background different race and mm. et- my approach changes with everyone but um <laughs> i just there is this inherent fear that what if i'm insensitive or what if i'm you know putting a single model to everyone so and this is going to come for any user researcher so in your experience have you experienced something like that and how did you deal with that Well, so if you've if you've offended somebody, obviously you, you try and backtrack as quick as you can and mm-hmm. and apologize profusely. I haven't I've I've been very lucky in that I haven't offended anyone mm-hmm. yet. Somewhere along the line, I'm gonna get called out, and I'm you know, hopefully that I, hopefully I, I I I give that person whoever calls me out. Uh, the same grace and respect that I would expect if I was calling somebody else out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. I I think first is this: put your user and your user's story first, mm-hmm. right? And then when you're doing your analysis and and you know, I, I always say that we're translators. Mm-hmm. We translate people's everyday language into business language right Mm -hmm. so in that idea when you're doing your analysis of what your user says or what your user does Mm -hmm. think of think of your work Mm -hmm. as how it applies to business decisions in other words business aims business goals now 
you can say that the entire purpose of capitalistic business is to put money in the pockets of shareholders. That's true. But in the small uh, microcosm of, of UX, mm. what you're really trying to do is you're trying to develop an accessible and intuitive uh, uh, business program yeah. uh, to bring uh, greater ease of use to a user. Yeah. If you put the user first and then make your business decisions based on those stories, you'll yeah. never fail. You'll never fail. Mm -hmm. I like that assurance <laughs> for yes. taking the stories first. So, yeah, even though I have a strict questionnaire to follow, not strict, uh, but yeah, I do have a questionnaire to follow. Yeah. All the insights and the stories that I, that I get from users automatically becomes of much more value to what I was going to ask. So, mm. so anyone starting out there, this might be of help to them. Mm -hmm. mm. So yeah. Okay. Now again, some a really different pillar. Uh, okay. You follow Zen Buddhism and the mm. philosophy of Buddhism. Yep. What I believe is that we have assumed this role in a corporate setting of a UX researcher, but there are things mm. within us that enable us to be great at the role that we have assumed or the role that we have chosen. Yep. So how is the philosophy of whatever philosophy that you're following, I would like you to elaborate on that. How is that enabling you to pursue greatness? in UX research? Because again, we are dealing with humans here. Uh, wow. Um, okay. Um, couple, couple thoughts. Hmm. One is that I'm, I, I'm a big believer that I'm, I'm a big believer in the truth that comes from Hinduism around the Atma, hmm. right? That we are all the self playing hide and go seek with ourselves, right? We're all the same self, but we all have different masks on. We're playing different roles in a larger drama. Mm. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so you're me, I'm you. We're just, we're having a conversation with ourselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. When whoever's listening or viewing on the outside or watching this exchange, that's us playing the viewer, right? Mm. Our users are just ourselves. And they have a they have a task based problem that we're trying to solve mm -hmm. in our present role, right? Mm -hmm. And we're all Oscar winners, we're all Emmy winners, we're all Tony winners, right? We all have, we all are award winning actors. We're all good at what <laughs> we do, right? Yeah. And whether we have, whether we have twelve cars in the garage or we have a cart pulled by a goat, we're mm -hmm. all rock stars, mm -hmm. right? We're just the self playing over and over again where the universe experiencing ourselves through different eyes one time one at a time that's it the zen part is really just the idea that the past doesn't exist and the future doesn't exist there's only the present <laughs> so the only way that you can improve this on the on the station at which you do your work <laughs> is to approach it with the same fun that we do as actors in this great play of life. Mm. Right? Mm. And it should be fun. If you get up every day and you're not having fun, you're not in the right, you're not in the right profession. Mm. And, and so there's that part of it. And then of course, you know, there's, there's a certain mod um, a modicum of, of serenity mm. where you can only affect the present moment right at any given time mm -hmm. uh, and if you keep that in mind mm -hmm. that the only thing that you can do is what you can do right now not mm -hmm. a moment before not a moment hence mm -hmm. then a good deal of the stress that comes with being a ux researcher is dissipated mm -hmm. greatly mm -hmm. um and so so there's that aspect of it. And I think that I think Zen Buddhism helps a ton with that aspect of, of kind of keeping the plates spinning without, without, uh, without pointing to people that there are actually plates in the air. Mm -hmm. In other words, there is no spoon. Mm -hmm. For Matrix fans. <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, now that even CEOs are talking about the philosophy that they follow or find comfort in. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I feel that as UX researchers, it becomes equally important for us to not forget this aspect of life. And especially in India, where, as I said to you before, that the foundations are just being said, more and more companies are adopting UX research, uh, and acknowledging it as an integral part so mm-hmm. like putting such ideas in the foundation is really necessary to make our profession evolve beautifully um, mm. purposefully yeah it shouldn't be a you know nine to five job where you just come you talk to people analyze that's it that that monotony it shouldn't be there that's what i envision it as and this is a initiative to maybe make that vision come true so yeah i think so ux actually goes beyond digital the digital world mm-hmm. um, and i th- i don't think that people have caught on to that yet i think that ux is is um you start out digital right, as digital scientists, essentially. But as you grow in the profession and as you grow in your practice, Mm -hmm. uh, I think you get to the point where you realize that UX extends a lot further Mm -hmm. than than just digital technology. It goes into relationships. It goes into um, how you view yourself, kind of your own philosophy on life, uh, and and relationships with with parents and things like that it kind of goes it runs the gambit as it says um, including in how you deal with people in your everyday life and I think hmm. I think once people get wise to that I think things will begin culturally to change mm-hmm. it's really great that you put it out there that transcends the realm of digital and technology mm-hmm. Thank you for saying that out loud uh, okay so i you have mentioned ux and scientific process like you mm-hmm. draw parallels between the research process and the scientific process and then mm-hmm. you can mention digital sciences mm-hmm. i have a really great view on that by someone else that uh, um comparing ux research to scientific methods is not accurate because most of the laws ux laws that we have is just pure common sense why while in science we arrive at something after running experiments in a very uh hit and trial method and yeah. then that becomes the law no matter what so in UX, mm-hmm. we are dealing with common sense and there are a lot of thoughts and hence biases involved. And science is completely different. The scientific approach is completely different. So what do you feel about this uh, UX? Is it a scientific process or not? I don't, I don't know who said that. <laughs> uh, I would love to know, actually, because I think that'd be a very interesting debate. Um, yeah. I think whoever said that is correct, actually. Mm. But I also think that they're being myopic in their in their approach. In other words, they're they're looking at uh, they're looking at two horses in two different stables. What I look at is a single horse and well, a single horse that's that's across two stables, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that person's right, but I I think that UX is a type of science, but with different outcomes. So um, science in an academic sense, whoever said that is correct, right? And and it becomes the law no matter what. And that law is then released across the whole of the world, right? It benefits everybody. Mm -hmm. UX science benefits really just the business you're working for. Hmm. Right. And hopefully, hopefully their heart's in the right place and 
and the, and it eventually benefits the world. But in the in the in the interim, it's going to benefit shareholders, mm -hmm. okay. uh, and and hopefully make them happy. So I think that I think that he's I think whoever said that's correct, but I also think that there's a case to be made for business science, mm -hmm. in the idea that the idea that the science that we're doing benefits business and and commerce. Uh, more than it does say, you know, curing the common cold, right? That has world over implications. Ours will have world over implications eventually. And if you don't believe me, then uh, well, find me a find me a car that doesn't have seatbelts in it. Modern day, right? That was a that was a science that was a scientific. Uh, experiment that was done during Robert McNamara's time at Ford Motor Company. And that was designed to keep people, Ford Motor Company uh, drivers safely. Mm -hmm. The only trouble was they couldn't figure out how to make people use the damn things. Most people didn't. Yep, yep. Yeah. So that was business science that eventually became ubiquitous the world over. Hmm. Heck, golf carts have seat belts in them. I mean, you know, those things don't go very fast at all, but they still have seat belts in them. Mm -hmm. It is like uh, making science or the results that came out of science more useful because mm -hmm. it's also the story of uh, in America, there were mm -hmm. like, American fire pilots were losing their lives because the cockpit and all the functionalities was so mm -hmm. difficult to use. It is only after mm -hmm. the designer came in and made it actually usable that the rate of deaths went down. So I told that story last night, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it just got like for I those who I for those who are know. listening, I'll tell that story if you don't mind. Uh, for those that are listening, the beginnings of human factors in ergonomic psy psychology was this. Mm. When in World War II, there, you couldn't, if you were a pilot for one aircraft, let's say you flew the uh, P-39 Aero Cobra, mm. right? You couldn't then jump into an F-4F F Wildcat uh, in, early in the war because the, the dials and, and all the uh, all the all the readings would be different, so you'd be so used to looking in one place for your altimeter, and it was all the way over here. Mm -hmm. So these guys would get go from the Air Cobra to the Wildcat, uh, and and fly the the first one great and the second one terribly because everything's different. So, so a human factor psychologist created something called what became known as the Golden Six, which is let's see if I can remember them: uh, altimeter, horizon. Uh, airspeed. Hmm. Oh God! Uh, uh, hold on. Uh, thrust or um, um, acceleration, hmm. and uh, compass. I think is the one of the them, and I don't remember. I'm not a pilot. My my brother's the pilot. My dad's the pilot. Uh, but now they're all they're all the same, no matter what aircraft you get into now, right? So you can go to the Aero Cobra, you can go into an uh, F4F or F5F, you can go into a, a Thunder Chief, mm. a Corsair, uh, 757, they're all, or 767, they're all the same six main con uh, controls. Mm. That comes, so that actually filters down throughout the year. So uh, if you get into a car, your speedometer is in roughly the same place that it always is. It always reads basically the same way. Hmm. Same thing with your fuel gauge; it's usually in the same place. The only difference is like on a like on a uh, like a Mini Cooper. Then it's in the center, but it's in the center of every Mini Cooper, hmm. right? And it varies from car from company to company. Um, and by the way, while I'm on the subject about science and business. Uh, we 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 gave the scenario of of uh, of ha having business science be uh, good for the world eventually, right? And and do good for all people. Mm -hmm. There is a flip side to that coin. There is a dark side to that, and that dark side would come with the example of, um, say, in the nineteen seventies, right? Mm -hmm. 
the the late 1900s as kids are fond of saying now right uh there were scientists who work for companies like nabisco who said that cigarettes were safe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. right now that's business science it mm -hmm. doesn't it's good for the company mm -hmm. hey cigarettes are safe we should smoke more of them don't worry about it you're fine yeah. <laughs> right yep made people money does it benefit the world over absolutely not mm -hmm. but there are people that still believe it so it does the door does swing the other way you can use business science for to do harm mm -hmm. to people i suppose it's just in what you're comfortable with i imagine those scientists uh published those reports that said that smoking was safe uh, with with a little bit of hesitation, I would hope that it did, right? But that's that's their job. It sucks. Yes, people die of lung cancer and secondhand smoke and, and emphysema and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But you know, eventually, I suppose it does turn into good because you know these doctors would go into court and say, "Yeah, we filed the report. Yes, it was wrong. We were dead wrong. Of course, they're addictive. Yes, they'll kill you." Mm -hmm. You know. So eventually, I guess the truth comes out and then benefits the world. Mm -hmm. So that raises a different question in my head, yeah. which is that even the term business science is disputable. Mm -hmm. It is more like manipulating science. You're mm -hmm. even manipulating science for the good of users that happened in the uh, airplane case where mm -hmm. whatever science was there in the cockpit, mm -hmm. a noble man made it more usable for humans, while mm -hmm. the other scenario, the science was manipulated for business mm -hmm. goals, for profit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can talk about this aspect where UX is uh, enabling us to um, design the science mm -hmm. outcomes for good. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> of course of course you would you might you could also make them the argument modern day right where do we where do we uh where do we meet people right we don't go outside anymore we don't ask people out to bars or anything like that we they're with our little iron thumbs right yeah that's true our thumbs do more for us socially than almost anything else and sell us things that uh that we want to buy and mm -hmm. and uh you know, track, you know, we track all sorts of things that our thumbs do. Our thumbs get us into trouble more than anything, right? Um, so it does swing, it does swing the other way. We, you know, as UX researchers, we want ideally for the users to tell us how to engage them more so that they'll adopt and spend the maximum amount of time enjoying our products, mm. right? And even if that means that they sit on their couch and enjoy them for 12 hours a day. Yeah. Hey, we're, we're getting advertising in front of them. What's the, what's the, you know, what's the problem with that? Right. Yeah. Um, and, we, and, and oh, by the way, we're getting them addicted to one of the most addictive drugs on the planet, right. Which is knowledge mm -hmm. and being able to facilitate and manipulate that knowledge in ways that benefit them and props to them alone. Mm -hmm. Don't know. Um, I just, I think it's very interesting. I think sometimes I think that what we do, yeah. what we do can have the effect of being more dangerous than, than a lot of, um, mm -hmm. a lot of really addictive drugs is that we, we encourage people to use apps and things like that and just programs in the, in a general sense all the time mm -hmm. um, so that there becomes a dependency on it like i can't travel around tulsa i've lived here a year i still get lost if i don't have my gps with me mm -hmm. i just don't i don't even think about it anymore um mm -hmm. you know if, if i'm trying if i'm out in the middle of nowhere and i want to grab something to eat out, out in the field why you mm -hmm. know if i don't have anything on me i'm in that GPS and and relying on it to tell me where to go. Mm -hmm. When I was in my 20s, there was nothing like that. We just you just knew where it was. You had that working memory of, of where you were at any given time. Mm -hmm. 
and experience would teach you the rest. Mm. So it is, it is a dependency and I'm, I'm just guilty as anyone. Mm. So it is what it is, right? Mm. We deal with, we deal, (laughs) we do what we do when we can and when we can't, we don't. (laughs) Golden rule of life. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so that makes me think of another important point. Uh, yeah. See the reason that you UX user experience is now getting more and more popularized is because it is it has entered the digital realm, and getting knowledge about the dig- digital realm, the softwares, the clouds, and everything, is easier than getting knowledge about the hardware stuff, the tangible things. You mm-hmm. have to have certain knowledge to be able to create a user experience for hardware. Even for mm-hmm. softwares, you need that. But the knowledge for software is much more accessible. That's why even I could get into it. If you yep. would expect me to start from hardware user experience, I would, could, wouldn't be able to do that. I'm, I'm also starting at the digital space. But at the same time, as you said before, that UX extends beyond the digital. I am working in an ed tech company and I hear parents complaining that my child is spending a lot of time on screen. Mm-hmm. So, As UXers, it becomes our responsibility to extend their experience beyond the screens. I know it's challenging and it's a good way of, for us to enter a more tangible aspect beyond softwares. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah your points and your thoughts uh, like uh, help me arrive at this realization that i think it is time for you know in the countries who have already done a lot in ux to start thinking beyond the screen so yeah thank you for your thoughts on that yeah uh for hardware mm-hmm. I think one of the best folks I've ever the the one of the best I've ever seen do it is in Lexington, Kentucky. I, I had the honor of interviewing with Lexmark, which is a printer company. Oh. And Lexmark has one of the most incredible corporate offices I think I've ever seen because they do troubleshooting there. And so you walk in and it's literally a factory floor. It goes on for like three football fields. It's gigantic. Mm. But tucked back in the in off one of the hallways is a is a lab mm. where they do something that I tell people that we should do more of, but often don't mm. um, don't get to see happen. And and what they do is they stress test mm-hmm. users uh, to work their printers when they break. And so when the printer breaks, right, they give them a task list that they're supposed to follow. And then they inundate them with phones ringing off the hook and sirens and all sorts of people knocking on the doors and just absolute chaos. And they have to follow the fix it list, right? The, to fix a printer that's jammed or, or the shoot and ink everywhere. And it's, it's, it's hard, man. And, and what they've found is that, uh, you know, when we do usability tests, Mm. everything usually works great. Mm. When you put the, put the user under stress though, and have them do it, Mm. it doesn't work so well. And there's a great example of this, uh, that, that I think y'all should try sometime. Mm. Uh, and I don't know if you, y'all have, uh, Pandora or Spotify there in India. We have. You do? Yeah. Well, next time you're driving, Hmm. and you happen to be out on an open road away from traffic or small children, Hmm. uh, try to drive and change the type of music you're listening to while keeping your eyes on the road Hmm. and see how many steps that takes and then see how well you can do it. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, Because I think you're going to find Hmm. that Spotify does really good user testing they don't really do stress testing. They don't really do testing while you're driving around in your car. Mm -hmm. They expect their users are going to be in a stationary position when they are utilizing their application, not in the car driving and distracted. 
Um, so definitely, you know, if you, if, for those of you who are just starting out in the field or who are, um, you know, in your more senior mm -hmm. and you're looking for some way to kind of, um, oh, kind of uh, spice up your usability testing, start mm -hmm. stress testing your users around different scenarios that where they might not have their full cognitive load in, in, in the working of your application. And I think you're gonna come up with all sorts of really interesting, <laughs> really interesting findings. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something, it's something that I wanna put in actually in our company is, you know, our dealers are, are, are some pretty stressed out cats, mm -hmm. right? And I, I often wonder if the reason why some of these, some of the, um, error messages or some of the uh, stress that they feel is because our system uh, works great when there's no one in the dealership, right? But when you put a load, a, a digital load uh, on the servers to make everything slow down and then put a cognitive load on the user, mm. I actually wonder if that's where most of it comes from mm. is that we don't stress test things and we don't, uh, not in a usability type of way. Mm. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that's something that we can we can expand upon on down the line mm. Mm. thank you so much for sharing that i didn't know about oh, you're welcome. go see go look at lexmark factor if they'll ever let you if they if they'll ever let if you're ever in lexington in kentucky go go see that factory or go see that uh that office it is something else that that lab is pretty special mm. awesome awesome thank you so much uh, so now to a very uh, popular and sort of the notion in our times, Web 3.0, <laughs> I want to know, oh my. <laughs> I'm sorry, but okay. <laughs> okay, so since there is so much noise and signal when it comes to Web 3.0 and crypto, um, what do you generally think about it? in terms of UX research, how is it going to affect our field? And uh, is there any method that you're applying to sift through the signal from the noise or you're just blocking it out? How are you dealing with all that? So, yes. Dealing with what? The noise around 3.0? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a fascinating idea. Hmm. I think it's really exciting, actually, if I'm honest, like if I'm, if I, I'm, I'm very much kind of a futurist, but I'm also a little conservative in my thinking and that we still haven't quite perfected web 2.0. Hmm. We are still dealing with things like security breaches, we still can't get, um, we're still dealing with, uh, you know, raids and and spam and just like the same things that we've been dealing with forever mm. uh, that i don't know or i don't i haven't heard that 3.0 other than being a utopia is going to fix any of it mm. um, now we've got now i just read something about um movie pass is gonna now tr is thinking about tracking your eyes to mm. ensure that you're watching ads mm. Oh, okay. Come on, come on. Let's see how many users agree to that. It's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see what happens in usability testing when they when they run that mile. Oh, look! It stopped the ad. That means you still have to watch it if you still want to go see the movie for free. It's like, really? Hmm. No, don't think so. But I'm not a user, so I could be totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. I think crypto is an interesting idea. I don't actually get most of it. I'm, I've tried to understand it. I think it's, it's not the utopia that I had always thought it would be, right? I still can't buy, like, I can't buy Bitcoin to save my life, essentially because I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's now become the, uh, the currency for the ultra wealthy. Mm -hmm. It's it just like it, it's, it doesn't do what it was purported to do. It was supposed to be kind of 
uh, a, a basic economy for everyone, right? A ubiquitous basic economy, a utopian basic economy, from my understanding. And I think, you know, I think that's going to be where it ends. I, I, not ends in the in like the like the ends type of, type of way, but um, I, I just don't. I, I can't. <sighs> I struggle with the idea of paying real, you know, government backed fiduciary uh, currency for essentially ski ball tokens, mm. right? In exchange for ski ball tickets that I can then exchange for a plastic ring. I just don't, I don't, I don't get the math, right? I'm, I'm trading a quarter. Mm. Right, that has a, a, a face value, an inherent value of 25 cents mm. for a token that has an inherent value of whatever five ski balls is. Mm. Right? And then when I get rid of the five ski balls, I get three tickets. Mm. I've changed a quarter that was a quarter no matter where you go mm. into paper tickets that I then exchange for goods in a shop where, where things that I can buy with it cost less than a penny to create. Mm. <laughs> that just, I don't know why, but I just can't get my head around that or why, how that's a good idea. And I think, I, and like NFT and artwork, like it just, it, there's something about it that makes my brain hurt. And I don't know if that's just the gray hair on my face and I'm just old, mm. entirely possible. I may be, it may have just moved past past me, but I just I can't I can't see entire nations or entire economies basing themselves around ski ball tokens. Mm-hmm. I just can't I can't do it. Um, I, just, I I have no idea how that works, and I, I, and I'm probably it likely uh, missing the boat entirely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I'm probably I will probably overstate that that the environmental impact of of uh, oodles and oodles and oodles of electricity it takes to to mine bitcoins is probably awful. Mm. Uh, it'd be it'd be like if I ran twenty diesel trucks at once, you know, and just left them running, right? I'm sure it's I'm sure I'm overstating that by a, a great amount. Mm. But between the environmental impact and and the fact that you're trading real money for like the you're trading the family cow for magic beans. That just, I just can't get my head around it. So I don't, I think 3.0 is a really interesting idea, yeah. but let's see if we can't perfect web 2.0 before we move into 3.0. Because I have a feeling the same issues that were in the first one are going to be in the second and probably even more, probably even more so, right? And, and we can't expect business to, to please itself. Look how well that's gone so far. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> uh, I have a hypothesis there again that the yeah. disclaimer that you're giving that I might be missing the vote, I might be wrong. That's I'm um, really certain I am. Somebody's going to see this and be like, that guy's out of his freaking mind. Yeah, but I guess that is coming from a place or the role that we are doing demands that kind of disclaimer we put on everything we think and say so i guess i feel that is coming from ux because uh, even i found myself uh thinking in such terms or with such disclaimers a lot lately so that is my hypothesis right there and you're probably not wrong (laughs) yeah and again regardless of our opinions and views and however we are able to wrap our head around this idea web 3.0 it mm-hmm. is affecting jobs uh, i know ux people who are trying to get into web 3.0 as soon as possible mm-hmm. and i am excited for it as well but at the same time i have this thought at the back of my mind what if it's an empty chase what if for my field it is not going to affect that much. Sure, I need to understand everything, the foundations, but how is it going to affect my role as a UX mm-hmm. researcher? Mm-hmm. The simple thing to assume is it won't affect much because you have to get the foundations right 
and talk mm-hmm. to users, get their opinion, get their lifestyle around. But that sounds sensible, but is it true? So what are your thoughts? Uh, that's a really good question. I So I played around with Roblox a little bit. Hmm. I've played around with some of the the, the virtual universes. Hmm. I, I think there's a lot to be done and use research around those. Hmm. Hmm. I also think the experience as it is right now leaves a lot to be desired. And and <laughs> oh my, um, let's see how much trouble I can get into and how quickly. <laughs> uh, I think that I think that on their surface, the metas. Are, are great, are a really cool concept. Mm. Right? As a futurist, I think they are amazing. Mm. I love the idea. I think the, the funny thing is, is that um, we talk about the Atman and, and wearing the mask and everything like that. And then um, we're going to make hardcore evangelicals use, use metaverses to communicate and buy, you know, items for their avatars. And I'm just like, you guys don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> It's like hello. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Um, I think it's an interesting thing, but I do think that um, eventually, what you'll what we'll see, and I'll probably be dead by the time this happens, and that's okay. I'll come <laughs> back as another character. Um, I think what we'll see are user researchers within metaverses doing user research on the experience of living in that world and and around mechan- the mechanics of our avatars and that sort of thing. That's where I, I think we'll end up and the buying experience of spending X amount of coins on um, or in-game dollars in, on uh, cars, planes, trains, spaceships, X-wings, you know, how that all goes. I, like that's where I see like my company, CDK, right? And that's where I see them going eventually is we'll have virtual dealerships where we produce virtual uh, um, vehicles of mm. every shape, color, size, and abilities for in-game cash. Mm. And that's where this will eventually go. Um, mm. Like one aspect of it, I think eventually we'll have to, mm. we always have, we'll always have cars to sell, right? Like tangible cars to sell. You have to go to the doctor. You have to, well, maybe don't anymore, right? There's, mm-hmm. You have to go places eventually to mm-hmm. do certain things, right? So we'll always have to, we'll always have something to sell in the tangible world. The virtual world, I think, though, is, is a very exciting place for UX research to kind of get in there and play ahead of time if only we could have companies that get, get us in. And I don't know anybody who's going to use research for Roblox or for... Um, who's doing meta uh, for for meta for meta now? Um, I, I don't know anybody on those teams, and I don't know what they're working on. And I surely don't think they'll probably <laughs> call me up and tell me. Uh, right? Yes. Um, Practically, yes. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> this isn't science. This is business. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's I think it's exciting, and I I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope that. That that you really can live on ski ball tokens. I think that'd be really cool. Mm. Yeah, even I have a lot of thoughts on that. Sometimes I become too grim. Uh, that what if we actually don't have any human com- qualities left to even do the kind of user research that we are doing? At least we can connect on some emotional level and you know extract something of value that others cannot articulate. Yep. At the same time, if I see the, you know, silver lining, then it can also be that maybe UX research becomes the only hook to reality in the corporate setting of something like metaverse or virtual Maybe. reality. I think that's an interesting perspective, actually. Yeah. And then yeah. we, as UX researchers, will become more valuable because everything is emanating from the reality. So we should have something that should keep us hooked to the ground. And that can be UX, who knows? <laughs> so, yeah. I think that's an interesting idea. I think, yeah, I, th- I think that would be a very interesting thing to experience actually. Like it's mm-hmm. the one, 
it's the one part of the metaverse which is just serenity <laughs> like, you walk out of the war and you're in like green fields with trees and birds and mushrooms and just sit and talk about the experience with somebody who's trained in this sort of thing <laughs> and then go back to the war <laughs> I, I think that'd be very interesting <laughs> yeah the, the, the time out place yeah 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 <laughs> yeah you're the, you know you're the first person who's ever asked me about 3.0 and about uh blockchain and nfts and that sort of thing you're the very first person who's ever asked me anything about that yeah. thanks for that I, I i uh i it's one of those things where i keep it i keep my opinions largely to myself because there's so many people working on improving the experience presently that if you go piping off about it there's a good chance that they're going to think that you're talking about them personally and i'm really not yeah. um I would, I would, I would plead ignorance on a lot of that stuff because I, it really just twists my brain up something terrible. Um, and I wish I understood it better. I was actually watching a, a thing called Line Goes Up the other night on YouTube, and and I just stopped after chapter one because the guy was just like, guy just went down a rabbit hole, and I'm like, wait for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand that feeling. Um... No matter if we are acknowledging or it or not, it is affecting us in some way in terms yeah. of the knowledge that we are acquiring. So I guess one of my fears is that people are sinking their life savings into these coins. And, you know, China did their thing where they devalued them and wouldn't allow people to trade on them anymore. And, you know, if everybody does that, everybody takes that tact. Mm -hmm. people's life savings are going to go down the tubes really, really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and what does that mean for the overall fabric of society as we all get older? Time isn't going to stop just because you have $3 billion in, in Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. You know, all it takes is, I don't know, shutting the machines off, I guess. And I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. And man, I sure try to try to understand it because I know a lot of my users probably use them to buy their cars and things. I just, mm -hmm. it's just really hard for me to wrap my head around. Mm -hmm. I so if there are any experts out there that want to like crayon, crayon and construction paper, what uh, Bitcoin and NFTs and, 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 uh, and blockchain are for, for an old man. Hey, I'm, <laughs> I'm down to listen. Uh, if you can tell me about it better than I can understand it. I'm, I am totally down. Even, yeah, even I'm talking to people who understand it fully and doing my own research. But again, okay. it's rabbit hole. And there, sometimes I feel it's like becoming a rabbit hole or people are making it yeah. a rabbit hole intentionally so okay. that it's more complicated and hard to get clarity on. And then lack of clarity leads to bad decisions. <laughs> And maybe, just maybe, some people are getting profit based off on our bad decisions in the crypto world. So, all and that's my other my that's my other fear, right? Is that it really is that the that the that the uh, bad press is true? That it really is a big Ponzi scheme, and the more people that buy into it, the the more inflated the numbers are. But you're really not, mm. you know what I mean? Like it's not. There's nothing there, mm -hmm. and I. Uh, that scares the hell out of me. Fear is often a more powerful motivator than mm. than uh, than compassion, right? So, like I said, man, I I could be way off base, and I probably am. There's probably somebody out there that's like, "That guy's an idiot. Don't listen to a thing he says." <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I'll take that criticism, especially on that subject. Mm. So that is why it becomes important for us to sift through the no noise and catch the signals because at the same time, blockchain is can be a very important technology in various aspects that we don't even imagine. But then again, you know, some voices are getting amplified a lot more. So instead of listening to those amplified voices, we should question why are they getting amplified in the first place. So, yeah. That is probably due to a, an algorithm more than anything. I'm sure I'd be amplified more if uh, if if Twitter put a check mark next to my name. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. What is it? What is it about that platform that allows some people to have their voices amplified as being authoritative or real mm. over others? Yeah. Mm. I that, that's another interesting, another interesting question. We'll have to we'll have to solve another day. Mm-hmm. Whenever Twitter gets their gets their uh, opens their books to give the omerta to people who uh, who are real and and deserve to be heard, mm-hmm. uh, I, that's the first thing I think of is uh, you know the the omerta that the uh, mob has to take right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Only you give it to a you give it to a little bird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey. yeah. <laughs> One day they'll one day they'll open the books and pick me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the best. <laughs> one, of, one of these days, I, I'll I'll wake up and I'll have a little check mark that tw- that says Twitter believes that I am who I am. <laughs> uh, even giving so much value to Twitter fulfills their agenda, actually. <laughs> so if yeah. you're validating Twitter's blue ticks, there you go. Absolutely, absolutely do. There you then, go. Yeah, like it. we are playing their game, <laughs> so yeah. they're obviously winning. And until somebody comes along and designs a better, a better platform or a more usable platform, we're kind of stuck with it. It's the same thing with, you know, Facebook and the rest of them. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're just they're just placeholding for right now, mm-hmm. right? In twenty years, Facebook will be the Alta Vista of the of the twenty twenties. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Uh, I think that's actually probably why they're trying to evolve now um, is so that they don't have that happen to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, who knows how that's going to turn out? I always think the politics of tech is an, it is a very interesting theater to visit. Mm-hmm. I'll stay, just visit. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> don't stay too long. You'll go, you'll go mush-brained. Yeah. So, Joel, thank you so much for your time. You're I most had welcome. Amazing conversation with you. We touched upon topics I couldn't even imagine could exist in a UX podcast. And again, that's the beauty of our field. We deal with everything. We talk to everyone and then yeah. make that information digestible and actionable. So that's why it's important for us to keep thinking through different lenses. And you enabled that today in my podcast. So this is so much fun. Have me on anytime you want to. I love talking with you. Yeah, awesome, awesome. That's great to hear. So thank you so much. It's almost morning here. It's 5 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Good morning, India. <laughs> love <Yeah>. y'all. <laughs> love you. Love every one of you. I'm yeah. wild about India. I'll retire there one day, probably. <laughs> yeah. It'll be awesome. We'll have a good old time. Looking forward to that. <laughs> My avatar here and retire there in person. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, metaverse. <laughs> right? You can be in America and India at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't work. I leave that to my avatar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You have a good day.